Welcome everyone to this um, program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I'm Catherine Wilhelm, the executive director, and we invite speakers from around the world uh, to share their expertise on a wide range of legal matters that involve Asia, uh, Asian law and international law in Asia. Um, so today's program, <laughs> our speaker today is Tamar Groswold Ozeri. And the topic is her new book, Law and Political Economy in China, The Role of Law in Corporate Governance and Market Growth. It's just been published by uh, Cambridge University Press. And it is a fascinating tour of the past four decades of Chinese political, legal, and economic development uh, with Professor Oza retracking changing market regulations and market growth and asking the question, what does law have to do with it? <laughs> Uh, China clearly does not fit into any pre-existing textbook theories about first establishing legal protection for private property, and then investors will come and growth will follow. So law drafting and legal institutions in China have frequently lagged actual um, growth. Uh, but does that mean law does not matter? Uh, and Professor Osri says, no, it matters very much. Uh, Throughout the reform and opening era, China has worked tirelessly to build its legal institutions. So why? Those are the big questions that she asks. Uh, Tamar Osri is an assistant professor at the Department of Asian Studies, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She's a scholar of both law and contemporary China, and her research focuses on legal and political elements that shape the development of the Chinese market with a special interest in enterprise organization, capital market formation, party state market regulation, uh, relations, and China's integration into the global economy. You can find her full biography at our website. So now, with no further ado, please. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Catherine. It's been a real uh, pleasure to be invited to present here. Uh, I've never been uh, at NYU. So this is my first time, but I've been an avid follower of Yusali's uh, events and blog, obviously. And so this is really exciting for me. And thanks everyone who joined us today, uh, whether online or uh, physically here. I know you have a lot of opportunities for talks and events to listen to. And so I'm very, very grateful for your time and your interest. So our discussion today indeed will focus on law and markets under Xi Jinping in the new era. It is based on a few chapters of my book, which is here and you can pass it along. Uh, it is available on Cambridge Core, so no need to buy this thing. Shh, I didn't say anything. But um, basically the book, as the name implies, is all about the relationship between law and politics and how such dynamics impacted uh, China's growth trajectory. So the motivation uh, behind the book is this conundrum that we're all uh, familiar with. Many, it occupies many China scholars across disciplines, right? Whether law or other disciplines, this conundrum about the role of law, or maybe I should say the absence of quote unquote, good law and legal institutions in China's quest to create markets. This skepticism with which we're all familiar, right? The idea that What's the importance of law, right? What is the importance of law in China, particularly in the economic context? And why, I'm, I was wondering, why is this skepticism so sticky, right? We're seeing the massive number of laws of regulations. We're seeing uh, legal institutions being established for decades, the massive amount of human capital, of political capital, of real capital that the party state is investing in advancing its legal system and legal scholars teach us for decades about the advancement that have been achieved, right? But still there's this uh, stickiness to the notion that the law in China is but a political mirage and that even if it exists on the books, it plays only a limited role in China's market growth. And to me, I think that the reason is our preoccupation with the rights securing functions of law. The premise that you need to secure and protect the rights of economic participants through a modern and reliable legal system, or else entrepreneurs will uh, shy from the market. They sense no credible commitments from, uh, for growth from the state. They will be uh, concerned from instability. 
they will be um, concerned from arbitrariness, you know, state confiscating your assets, and they will be disinclined to continue investing. And so uh, financial markets will um, not develop and by extension, growth will slow down. Now, of course, uh, many uh, contributions discussed how China deviates from this paradigm, right? We have Donald Clark's uh, rights hypothesis, hypothesis piece with uh, Professor Abham's uh, property fallacy. A lot of scholars talked about how China deviates from this paradigm and scholars across disciplines showed us how in lieu of the institutions that are traditionally held imperative for growth, China was able to develop substitutions, right? And these vary across disciplines. We have uh, political connections, we have bureaucratic incentives, we have central local relations, we even have uh, Confucian work ethics as substitutions. Recent years, the discussion comes forth again, it surfaces again, why? Because China's growth slows down and we're starting to see writers in the media Foreign affairs especially excels in this type of writing where we see uh, commentators again predicting China's demise. They look at the crackdown on private tech firms and they argue that the lack of rule of law is to blame, that uh, negative investor sentiments derive from the fact that they sense instability, they sense that uh, the, the state is arbitrary, the arbitrary incursions of the state on their, uh, on their assets, on their rights. And so, the outcome of it is that substitutions can only go so far, right? Beyond a certain development threshold, substitution cannot uh, hold for long and growth will halt, halt and, uh, and uh, maybe eventually it did stop. And so this is another affirmation for them for, for, for those uh, claims that the law in China is weak, it's a political mirage, it's window dressing and again, played only a marginal role, role in China's market uh, world. And so in this book, I try to push back against this prevailing notion. And I join efforts by scholars to basically show the importance of law in China, specifically for the creation of markets in the case of this book. I argue that the law and in this context, formal, law, positive law, right? So formal law and legal constructs was actually instrumental to China's market rise. But in order for us to understand exactly how and truly evaluate the full contributions of law to the development of markets in China, we must lose our tunnel vision. We must lose our preoccupation with rights, uh, uh, if you will. Now, I know I need to remind myself I'm from Israel, but I'm standing in an American university. So I just want to calm everyone down <laughs> and say that, you know, I don't downplay, I don't mean to downplay the importance of rights protections. Rights protections, quality of private enforcement is vital. Those inquiries are important for our understanding of how legal systems operate, of the efficacy of a legal system, right? How citizens sue. Uh, uh, and, and protect the rights in practice. Again, not to downplay, but this is not the only thing that we should consider when we're trying to evaluate and fully understand how legal systems may support uh, growth. So what I offer instead is uh, law and political economy as an alternative framework to look at China's growth process. And what I'm, uh, um, the framework basically considers both the economic functions and the political functions that the law provides for China's politics and how law and politics entwine in China's quest to create uh, markets. To do this, I analyze a vast number of law and policy documents, including all available uh, market-related CCP policy, plenum communiques, five-year plan speeches, charter amendment, amendments, and so on. Um, practically, all available or everything that I could put my hands on, right? Market related uh, laws and regulation, regulations, both secondary and uh, tertiary regulations, largely following Perry Keller's distinction. Uh, and I look at it from 78 to 2021. And the main idea is basically to show how law and legal constructs were used to allocate economic authority within the party state system from the early days of reforms until the present. And in that, the law uh, helps structure and secures a certain desired political equilibrium change at each stage of China's market development. 
I apply the same uh, analytical framework on corporate governance and the evolution of the public firm as my case study, showing that the dynamics of law and political economy had real market effect on how firms, on the environment within which firms operate. So for example, in the context of corporate governance, the framework I think brings us more clarity on various unresolved uh, corporate governance phenomena. So for example, this existence of facially convergent corporate governance institutions, right? China has all of the um, uh, institutions that we would expect to see in corporations under corporate capitalism, right? It has board of directors, independent directors, supervisory boards, uh, committees, and so on and so forth. It also has one of the most shareholder empowering statutes in the world. Chinese corporate law on the books provides shareholders, the shareholder assembly, with a massive uh, a, a really strong scope of uh, power within the corporation. At the same time, we know that de facto, the um, economic rights protections of public shareholders is still rather weak, right? And we still see this public market uh, uh, growth. So questions then come forth as to why do we still even have those um, traditional corporate governance mechanisms if they do not provide their economic function. And there were some answers as to, well, this is really for the foreigners to see, right? Some, some people argue that gives legitimacy. It's, it's a way to pull, to pull money. And so I think that the law and political economy framework give us a little bit more um, um, uh, complexity to the story and really explains why do we still have these mechanisms? How did they evolve? What other functions do they serve if not those economic rights protecting uh, functions? Uh, so this was some word, a little bit of uh, uh, words about the book and the analytical framework. Now I'd like to give you a taste by quickly getting into the weeds of the current era where we see what I term a legalized politicization uh, in the market. So to contextualize the current, the current era, let's quickly look at the trajectory of China's market development from 78 until the present. We can identify basically three eras. So we can identify three eras and two major shifts uh, in uh, market governance equilibrium, I call it equilibrium, where we see political economic powers shifting from one party state hierarchy to the other. Now, the first shift from a decentralized uh, governance authority to a more centralized governance in the uh, modern reform era, this is something that is highly recognized in the political science literature, right? The second shift from a uh, modern reform era here to the new era happens here in 2010, 2011, is uh, really a shift from a centralized state to a centralized party state. And this shift is getting more and more recognition in the literature. And this is really the new era on which we'll focus. So if we jump to this second era here from the early 90s until the end of the uh, first decade of 2000s, an era that I term the legal uh, modernization era, the Chinese market during this era had formed around features of state capitalism much of which owe substantially to legal constructs, right? Think the use of legal constructs for corporate form, for the creation of the idea of share ownership, pyramid holding groups, institutionalized central administrative powers, and so on. So legal constructs became the backbone of the in the construction of China's state capitalism during the legal modernization uh, era. But what's important to understand for our context is that while state capitalism uh, during the legal modernization era has brought with it substantial uh, market growth and set the stage as we know for China's international competitiveness, it also produced some serious negative governance uh, results. In terms of corporate governance, for example, state capitalism resulted in entrenched and weakly monitor corporate insiders and controllers that could easily exploit public shareholders and basically drain corporate assets, at that time mostly a state assets. Uncontrollable corporate groups, both state and private national champions, emerge 
with SASAC, the State Asset Administration Commission that's supposed to supervise them, being unwilling or unable to control asset stripping, sorry, asset stripping, related market transactions, self-dealing, and all of the other um, um, uh, controlling shareholder illnesses that we know from other places in the world. Alongside those illnesses, we have some idiosyncratic problems, right, such as local protectionism, such as massive corruption and capture. All of these things surfaced in the market in full force. And so what we're seeing that they have started threatening not only economic results and the stability of the market, but also the legitimacy of the CCP and the entire system. All of this was happening, and we need to remember that at the same time as markets grow and develop, the party state started to lose the levers of macro control that it had, right? Because state ownership started diluting, right? Through diversification, pyramid holding groups, and so on and so forth. And so basically, gradually, the party state is losing the levers of macro market controls. Now, while micro control was always something that was politically uh, contentious in China, Macro control was never something that the party state wished to give up upon, right? Macro control is the, the ability to steer the market at large, if you want to borrow a uh, very not very not term. So these mounting political and economic problems produced by state capitalism at the turn of the era, to me, explain much of the subsequent uh, shift in China's political economy and the use of law uh, in the current era, during the new era. The party state needed to reassert control more directly. The party no longer trusted the state to do the job alone. So moving to the current era, we can clearly see how law and legal constructs are being used as an effort to overcome the challenges brought by state capitalism and secure this new political economic equilibrium within the party state, one in which the party regains or reasserts through the law levers of control over uh, governing the market. And we'll see it uh, now. I call this the legalized politicization era, obviously because again, the CCP uses law and legal constructs uh, to establish itself directly in the market. Now, one thing before I show you uh, the analysis here. What's important to understand, I think, or remember, is that while the law open up, as we'll see, opens up direct opportunities for uh, mark party, sorry, for party agency in the market, we shouldn't understand from that that the state is receding from market governance altogether. Quite the contrary. What we're seeing is that legal constructs are actually being used to enhance macro controls on both fronts. At the state front, we're seeing legal constructs being used to reinforce both the ownership capacity of the state in the market and boost the regulatory capacity of the state in the market. Ownership capacity. So we said state ownership capacity and regulatory capacity. So in terms of the state ownership capacity, from 2012, we're seeing new wins in implementing China's mixed ownership reform. For those of you less familiar with the mixed ownership reform, the program was advanced in the early 2000s. And the idea was to mix public ownership with private ownership by infusing public firms, SOEs, state-owned enterprises, with private capital, right? But from 2020, what we're, 2012, what we're seeing is that this scheme is put to use to expand the reach of the state into the private sector through various legal constructs. First, our M&A rules. So interestingly, the number of M&A rules that address mixed ownership rose from an average of 3.5 rules annually in the legal modernization era, so throughout the 90s and the first decade of 2000, to an average of 34.25 MA rules addressing mixed ownership annually uh, from 2013 to 2021. So a lot of MA regulations suddenly shifting uh, capital throughout. We're seeing various direct investment contracts promoting mechanisms to uh, uh, assign the state with special management rights, 
in the media, it's called golden uh, shares because uh, it, it's similar to mechanisms that you can find in France or in Israel, whereby the state receives some priority rights in a corporation. Um, so we see this in subsidiary of Alibaba, in uh, Weibo, we're seeing it in Douyin. Um, mostly, so far at least, subsidiaries of uh, internet content providers. So specific uh, uh, veto or participation rights for the state as an investor holding 1% or less, uh, giving it certain types of vetoing power over certain decisions. Another thing, another legal construct that does that is the creation of joint state and private funds. So basically uh, funds that are tailored to invest in emerging industries, both domestically and overseas. These are the legal instruments that we're seeing used to expand the reach of the state uh, in the market and help it regain macro market uh, controls. The second aspect of use of law to strengthen the governance capacities of the state is boosting the regulatory state. And by this, I mean the authorities of the state to legislate, regulate, oversee, and apply administrative enforcement functions in the market. It has been given to fewer uh, central state institutions. And so here, I think we really see the framework of a socialist rule of law has been uh, instrumental in advancing that state capacity, right, from the uh, third uh, plenum of the 18th Central Party uh, Committee. On. So in terms of how does it look in the data, let's, um, let's look at some charts, right? So these charts show political economic shifts through the lens of law. And what do I mean by that? They show activism in market-related rulemaking. Uh, which I use in the book as a proxy to the allocation of market governance powers, meaning to whom the authority to govern markets was granted, okay, was allocated in each period. So if we look at the upper figure, if we look at the figure at the top, we can see a newly issued and revised market-related leg legislation and regulation at all three levels. So primary, secondary, and tertiary rules. And if we compare the current era from 2010-ish um, till uh, 2021 with the era that preceded it, with the legal uh, modernization era, we might be seeing an interesting surge here in 2011 and in 2018, but like overall in aggregate, it seems like legal activism in the current era is actually lower than it was in the previous era, right? It seems. Uh, that actually maybe uh, what I'm saying is wrong. But then when we break it down to only primary and secondary uh, uh, law and regulation in figure uh, 5.2, when we break it down to the different hierarchies, we can see that while tertiary legal activism um, has receded, there has been a rise in secondary and primary lawmaking. And I have the average uh, per year if someone is interested later. So at least based on rulemaking activism, establishing a rule of law governance, the framework in the market, is essentially a form of advancing a hyper-centralized regulatory state. This is about the uh, governance capacities of the state in the market. But as I mentioned, this is certainly not the only thing that the law is doing in the uh, current era. Let's move to the most Maybe, or, or at least the more interesting stuff, right? The party, the use of law to elevate direct market capacity for the CCP. So I identify three um, legal constructs or pathways uh, through which um, uh, the market capacity of the CCP has been established or enhanced. First is the, the uh, capacity of the CCP as a market regulator. The second is the capacity of the CCP as a corporate stakeholder or a market participant. And the third is formalizing the CCP's market-related uh, rulemaking, uh, decision-making bodies, sorry. Let's start with the first pathway. The CCP is a direct market regulator. As some of you might be familiar, but during the 18th and 19th party Congresses, so from 2012 onward, the CCP's involvement in the process of devising laws and regulations has been increased, right? The 
there were party guidelines in requiring, sorry, that the drafting of laws and regulations that are related to uh, important social, political, and economic issues will be first deliberated by the um, party organization at the relevant administrative hierarchy. But even beyond this time of this type of kind of like background uh, involvement in rulemaking, the CCP's direct regulatory power increased. And here we can see this measured by the number of jointly issued uh, market related CCP and state council opinions and uh, guiding opinions. This is by absolute numbers. And if we look at the annual average at each era to compare um, you know, apples to apples, we see it very, very clearly. We see the increase of the CCP's assertion of regulatory capacity with respect to markets. It's very, very uh, clear. What about the party as a market participant or a corporate stakeholder? So since about 2015, uh, we see a gradual formal retreat from uh, what it is to us a more familiar conventional corporate governance institutions. So think board of directors and independent directors and supervisory and audit committees and so on. They still exist, of course, and they function, but alongside them, the party has institutionalized political mechanisms into the governance of firms. And it has done so in two uh, meaningful rate ways. One is to establish a corporate party committee within firms. And the second one is to institutionalize the disciplinary and monitoring functions of the party and streamline it into corporate governance. And I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. But in terms of the first issue, the party committees, so since 2015, since the issuance of the SOE reform guiding opinion, corporate party committees uh, within state invested enterprises were reaffirmed as a statutory obligation. I should note because I'm gonna be asked about it. Um, there's no similar statutory obligation for private firms. We can expand on that later, but uh, no similar statutory uh, requirement for private firms. State controlled firms basically need to have this established in their articles of association. Now, I do want to clarify that um, the charter of the CCP, the uh, constitution of the CCP, as well as the PRC company law, already enabled the creation of party committees in any company with more than three party members, right? Any PRC domiciled company with any three or more party members. So the legal option to establish a party organ within Chinese firms, whether these are uh, um, um, you know, uh, foreign owned or Chinese owned, no matter how uh, big is the ratio of state investments in them, this legal option was there at least from when the company law was, uh, was the, the current company law was established. However, only since 2015, we're seeing this coming to life coming to life with, first of all, more elaborated rules that actually explain, in some terms at least, uh, the roles of these committees, give them explicit oversight and disciplinary functions within firms, as well as more decision-making powers within firms. So for example, the party committees are given authority with respect to the management of personnel, right? They can recommend and assess and nominate candidates for directorial and managerial positions. We have uh, an encouraged cross-representation of board members and members of the uh, party committee. We have an alignment in the position of the board chairman with the party secretary as a default uh, rule. And we have the authority to oversee audit and assess uh, major corporate decisions. So more authority defined within firms. There's also more systematic implementation of this. If in the past we used to be seeing this only in the biggest uh, SOEs, the most controlled SOEs, now these things are, uh, as we said, mandatory for state invested enterprises and spilling over also to, um, though to a lesser extent, to the private uh, sector. And actually, uh, Professor Angela Zhang here from HKU was one of the first uh, scholars that actually looked at the 
uh, empirical uh, uh, status of implementation of this provision. There's also research by Lauren Lynn and Milhub that shows variations in the adoption of this thing, but generally speaking, we're seeing an increased uh, implementation of these provisions in corporations. Okay, so another point of interest of authority that is given to the party committee within terms is the authority, it's actually one of its primary roles, the authority to monitor and oversee legal compliance. So base, basically open and uh, uh, keep an open eye for observing uh, violations of law. In this respect, what we're seeing is the integration of the function of this internal corporate stakeholder with external uh, now institutionalized capacities of the party, uh, uh, disciplinary capacities of the party. And this sounds uh, very complicated, but I'll explain it. So the institutionalized capacity of the party to apply external um, uh, inspections is mainly mentioned in the context of disciplinary inspection, right? Of inspection against corruption. We have CCDI, the uh, Commission for Disciplinary Inspection, which was institutionalized also in 2018 under the National Supervision Commission, right? So, and this is also a legal, legalized form of, uh, of authority, right? So basically, we have this uh, institutionalized capacity of the party's external disciplinary mechanisms cooperating with an internal corporate stakeholder, the internal party committee, in identifying corruptions within SOEs, identifying corruption within corporate pyramid groups. We have a, a cooperative process. And I think that it makes, uh, um, uh, it makes easier makes it easier for the party and for the disciplinary enforcement apparatus of the party to basically gain access to information and detect and punish and prevent uh, corruption, importantly, with spillover effect onto corporate malfeasance more generally. And if you're interested in the book, there's an illustration where I give an example how this cooperative process between the corporate party committee and the function of the CCTI is, or CCDI uh, organs, basically the cooperation between them have been applied in this uh, um, corruption investigation campaign against one of China's most powerful uh, corporate group, the uh, CNPC, China National Petroleum Corporation. Okay, so is, I just mentioned some positive effects of this cooperation, right? We're exposing corruption in the corporate sector, we're exposing corporate malfeasance and so on. Of course, these could be some added values, right? But this politicized corporate governance also, of course, enable um, the party to more easily mobilize both corporations and corporate groups, right? Pyramid groups in the service of the party state's uh, shifting priorities. Okay, so this has been uh, so far, we've basically talked about two of the party capacities that have been expanded through law. One was direct market, market regulatory power. The other was direct uh, stakeholder uh, presence in the market. And the last thing, which I don't really have time to expand on, is um, a legalized pathway for more direct party uh, agency in the market by formalizing some of the party's decision-making organs. Some of you might have heard about leading small groups, turning commissions and the supra ministries, right? Uh, um, I mentioned the uh, National Supervision Commission, Angela here, researchers about uh, the cyberspace administration of China. So there are uh, several decision-making bodies that also receive more capacity with respect to markets uh, through the process of legalization or formalization. Um, again, I call this legalized politicization. Um, and how does all of this relate to the overall law and political economy framework that I propose? If we look at political economic change through the lens of law in each era, we can see how changes in the political economic power within the party state hierarchy are translated into legal authority to govern markets, into legal agency in the market, how law and legal constructs in turn 
help enshrine uh, the desired shift, the desired the shift that the party state aims for in each of these uh, eras. Now, of course, we have many open questions about it, right? We have an important question whether or not uh, through legal constructs um, uh, will be better able to maybe hold party members from spilling their intervention over to micromanagement, right? Can, can the law hold them back better than just party directive? There are a lot of open questions about their legal accountability. What's the legal accountability of these ins legalized institutions, right? Regardless, I think that in considering the overall institutional dynamics in China's development process and the ways in which law and politics uh, serve each other in the process of economic uh, development, I think that it becomes clear that the CCP recognizes the importance of law, not only for getting the economy right, and by this I obviously mean right by how the Chinese party state wants the economy to be right under the socialist market economy, but also as an internal party state instrument for allocating powers uh, internally. I think that um, I will skip the contributions of the book. We can discuss this later if it's uh, interesting. If not, uh, then I welcome questions and any other thoughts and comments. Thank you. So thank you so much. This was, uh, you've given us a huge amount to discuss. Um, and challenged us to think in a more diverse and sophisticated way about the role of law <laughs> than, than simply, as you say, moving out of a law and development formulation of, you know, put the rules in place and then everybody feels comfortable driving on the road. Um, I wanted to pick up on the last part. Um, and by the way, I want everybody to start thinking about your questions, including those online. We're mm -hmm. going to, if you're, if you're watching remotely, please enter your questions into the question queue in Zoom, and then we'll be turning to those uh, and start taking them in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions first, starting from the last part of your presentation about the role of the party, because that is, of course, one of the things that we're all most focused on in the last few years. Uh, it's become very obvious. Um, I loved the table that you had, figure 5.4. Okay. Well, you actually <laughs> did the work of counting <laughs> how many joint state council and party uh, central committee general office joint regulations have been issued because it's been obvious to anybody who follows them that right. there's a lot right. more, but you actually gathered the data and showed us the chart. There's no question of this greater role that they're playing. But you you said something a little bit provocative that I wanna ask you to elaborate on. You said that the party no longer trusts the state to do the job. Mm -hmm. So other than extrapolating from the numbers and seeing the party is clearly intervening directly, why do you say that? What makes you think that, the, that, that it's a question of trust? Mm. Um, I think that it, it comes pretty clearly in the corporate context specifically. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that I use uh, the, the corporate governance and the evolution of public firms gets such a substantive, uh, substantive part of the book is being a case study to mm -hmm. all of these uh, claims. Um, I think that once we really understand the, um, on the one hand, the problem that um, the state as a massive shareholder in the market produces for the party mm -hmm. and with all the side effects of it, right? The corruption, mm -hmm. the regulatory capture, right? The Olsonian problem of not being able to introduce reform because you have cronies holding all these positions, right? Alongside the issue of state institutions not being able to prevent those costs, right? SESAC not being able to minimize enough at least uh, asset stripping and uh, related party transactions and so on and so forth. I think that once we consider this corporate context, we understand that um, the party does not, again, I don't wanna call it trust, call it uh, believe the state is able. Yeah, I mean, call it however uh, you want, but I think that this, the, the party uh, feels the need to step in more directly mm -hmm and uh, lead this change. Now, beside the corporate context, there are also uh, various institutional reforms 
in the governance of uh, party and state institutions that are going on throughout the era that also reflect the same shift, I think. So, and um, some of them are. Is the problem, as you just described it, that the, the party never actually gave the state institutions the power they need? So in other words, this question of being willing to allow the state to be an agent that operates over the party, that was always, mm. the, the party always withheld that permission. What I'm thinking of, for example, is when a senior party official, or really at any level, but we see this at the senior level, when someone like Zhou Yokong, as you showed on the screen, mm -hmm is um has has a senior position the first thing you hear is that they are under investigation by the party through the party process and only later does this after the party has made its decision on how to handle the case and the individual has been stripped of their party not only the party positions but the party membership so that they're no longer a comrade mm -hmm. then only are the actual state agents the prosecutors allowed to step in and take over the case. So so the state has never, the state agencies have never been given the right. power to, to, to police the party. So you're bringing, uh, you're bringing up a good point that it's not only the um, uh, intent mm -hmm. of the party to, to do what I suggest that it does mm -hmm. now, but also the fact that the state institutions were not able so also the ability and and i think that uh you're absolutely right because indeed um the party preserves both the carrots and the sticks right mm -hmm. cadre evaluation system is motivated by the organizational department criteria right nomenclature system so we also have the carrots that the party offers that can better mobilize uh um, corporate parties or uh, you know, um, uh, meaningful state officials, but we party also preserves the sticks, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, which is the uh, anti-corruption apparatus and the enforcement institutions of the party. And also in general, I think fear governance, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of fear governance is something that the party controls. It's not something that the state controls. So I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as somebody has party membership, it's like a little protective shroud, right? That's so over them. They're not touchable. Yeah. until they've been stripped of that i mean i think that they are touchable in their state capacity mm -hmm. right when they hair when they when they wear the state hat mm -hmm. <laughs> when they're also officials mm -hmm. but of course this the the party preserves the levers mm -hmm. uh to decide whether or not they will be found accountable uh in that capacity as well so uh i want to start taking questions I think um, just congratulations on the book. I mean, it's so great that you weave together all the development that happened um, and into one book. I mean, I think there is definitely a demand for a book like this. Um, my question uh, relates to a lot of the party uh, in institutionalization of the party organization within corporations. So I did a lot of research uh, at the beginning. Um, looking at um, you know how the firm's adoption of the the corporate charter amendments and uh, to include incorporate uh, part, enhanced party building within the corporations, mm -hmm. um, and we I, we also look at the private firms by the way, and yeah. um, one thing we weren't able to look at because of the data set because it happened so quickly and it takes a long time for us to observe impact. It is the long term impact, like the empirical question of right. what will be the impact of the institutionalization of party organization within mm -hmm. uh, companies? Um, it probably would take like five years' time or 10 right. years right. for us to look back at the data to see the impact. I wonder in your research um, whether you encounter any qualitative mm -hmm. evidence so far. Um, because you are the one of the rare scholar out there who actually think that there are, you know, benefits to this kind of uh, cooperation. I mean, that it reduces corruption. It's you know having the parties tight in control. Um, you know, reduce a lot of the agency costs mm -hmm. within those firms. And you are one of the few. And I think you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do agree with you. But at the same time, it does come with side effects. <laughs> But it does right. come with side effects because it, it, you reduce the autonomy of those firms, of the managers, right? I mean, their incentive might be dampened uh, to pursue 
profit driven goals or, or other things. So curious what 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 you found so far. Right. So um absolutely we have a question of cost and benefit set off that has not been revealed yet in full at least right because the, the reform has been gradual and uh, it also really depends on where the market pulls and what's the public opinion about it like we're seeing waves of slow implement implementation or quicker implementation in, in each uh, uh, stage. So uh, from what I saw from empirical research that was conducted more or less until the until 2021, um, there are evidence, there is evidence, sorry, that there are some positive uh, market effects. Uh, I've seen recently in some data and it's in the book and also in a, in a separate uh, article uh, at American Journal Comparative Law that actually looked at how markets will react once a party committee is established within firms. And what the scholars have found is, you know, ho and behold, of course, this is not very, very, very uh, surprising because it's it's pretty expected that for uh, locally controlled uh, SOEs, there is a much more positive market effect than when this is established in a private firm, and there are, of course, different variations according to the level of state ownership. But uh, there are indications that uh, whether it is the market response positively to this, at least then, I think that today things have completely shifted, and I blame geopolitics uh, for that, and we can talk about it for hours. Um, but um, uh, at least then, uh, there were some positive market effects to that extent. Uh, investors, at least in, in a certain group of firms, evaluated that, that more monitoring within the firm will reduce uh, asset stripping and related party transactions. Now, in terms of corruption, I did not see any um, uh, empirical piece, at least when I did this research. And, and then I didn't see empirical piece that connected between the uh, impact on corruption in general and the effect on SOEs. But what I actually saw yesterday that uh, there was a piece published at the, uh, uh, uploaded in the uh, um, uh, NBER, the uh, uh, economic uh, network, uh, that act of, of, of two American Chinese descendant, I think American scholars and two scholars from Tsinghua showing uh, actual evidence for um, uh, corruption reduction in general in terms of the anti-corruption campaign. So again, I didn't see anything that is specific as to how, how firms react, but there is apparently some evidence and scholars are working right now. I didn't do the empirical research myself. But... My question is almost word for word with Catherine's, but I think I come from a, well, I know I come from a much less knowledgeable background. You, you said that the party at one point in talking about the third period, the party no longer trusted the state. How are they different? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, isn't, aren't all the top people in the state part of the party? Mm -hmm. uh, that's like a, a, a very, very big question, right? So I think that in terms, first of that's all- That's at the core of your talk. Right, so first of all, numerically, no, there is a difference, right? It's not the same, uh, it's, it's not, uh, one to one the same apparatus, right? Because if we look at the party, 90 million people, um, we know that 95% um, of state officials are party members. However, 95, you said? 95%, that's the, you know, there are some controversies that are amazing article by Yuan Yuan Ang talking about, she's a political scientist now at John Hopkins talking about the troubles of identifying public employ employment or <laughs> public, right? So there are, of course, it's it's not a, an absolute definitive number, but uh, let's say a very, very high percentage of um, of state officials are CCP members. But out of the 90 million party uh, members, only about 7.5 million are party state officials. So this basically, at least according to the 2018 statistical uh, 
um, your uh, bullet time, party statistical bullet time. So this basically means that there are tens of millions, right, party members that are not, don't feel any obligation or affiliation with the state, right? In a sense, they feel more solidarity, assuming that a farmer who's a party member feels solidarity with the party, but they don't feel any uh, obligation or connection uh, to the state. Now, the overlap, we need to remember, the overlap is much uh, tighter at upper level levels of the administrative system, right? So this basically means that the, the central party state levels, their interests align a great deal more than the interests of lower uh, administrative levels, I think. And if we keep in mind that um, citizens when they think of the state, what they see is the local government, right? That, this is the state for them, right? Then uh, there's much more alienation towards, I think, the, the state than there is with the party state, if it makes sense, right? And the party necessarily also uh, advances this by aligning the feeling of nationalism with, with the party. With the, with the central party state. So there is an added value to the party that, that individuals uh, will feel that local government is their state representative, but will feel much more, I think, uh, identi identify much more with the central uh, party state. So I think that this actually brings us to the, the bottom line that um, I think that in terms of how the party sees things, uh, it will be easier for the party to mobilize individuals and firms through its party capacity than through the local government capacity or through the state capacity because of that kind of feeling of uh, connection. And it relates also to, what my, to my response to Catherine because once we understand that the party is the one that holds all the carrots and the sticks, then the party agency is the one that actually can better mobilize those uh, corporate insiders and uh, uh, political uh, members to do its bidding than the state. Makes sense? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, assume the usual protestations of ignorance, which in this case are sincere and accurate. Mm -hmm. The time I, I spent at one point in time in a village, I don't know that was Hubei or Hubei, or I mean, I, you know, it was Mississippi or Minnesota, but, uh, and the government official in this village was chosen more or less by the people in the village. The party official came from the party. The former had all of the allegiance and loyalty of the people. The, the party person was reviled. Mm -hmm. uh, does that, is that, this was a long time ago, but is that separation gone now? Or does it, does that, exist inside corporations or state-owned enterprises? Or is it just, I mean, this is classic anecdotal, you know, person goes, sees an elephant, comes back and knows all about elephants. So what about these elephants? I don't know completely. I, I, I'm certain that there are variations. I'm certain that there is more alignment where the party feels the need to align those uh, those roles and those powers, right? When the corporation is more strategic, when uh, uh, it's an industry that um, feels no need to keep competitive, right? Um, I think that there's a sense of, um, in one hand, on the one hand, the party wants now 
and, and again, it's kind of like understanding and speculations a little bit, right? Because it's all still a very much black box and we, we extrapolate from what we understand and read, but it's not necessarily what happens and applies on everything equally, right? So just with this caveat in mind, right? I think on the one hand, there is in this era a greater uh, need for um, the party or, or at least a, a, a greater understanding that there should be more alignment between the central state and the party, both in terms of, uh, you know, making the management of the market and of the administrative system more efficient, making information flow better, right, making coordination better and all of these uh, issues, and really aligning the interest of central state institutions with those of uh, party institutions. So there is this uh, a part of the face of the coin. On the other face of the coin, the party also wants to keep itself isolated in many, many, or not isolated, but distinct from the state in many, many ways. Because, and if I go back to your question about what is the difference between the party and the state. So for example, in the, um, in the corporate context, we're talking about a party committee in firms, but you can say, why does the party need a separate agency in the firm? The state could have, as a controlling shareholder, could have done everything it wanted and, you know, tunnel the uh, the interest of the party anyway, right? Assuming that, uh, that this is correct. So let's assume for the moment this is correct and there's a high level of alignment between the two. Still, from a legal standpoint, we need to understand that this change is actually profound because the state operating is a state shareholder, it is bound to a certain legal capacity, right? It is, it is, it has to confine with corporate decision making procedures, right? It has to confine, it, it is, it is, it, it, it might be found accountable to law, right? Shareholders might sue it. The party agency in the corporation has no accountability in front of, of, of you know, in, in the corporate. So that process legal and, accountability is real. In terms of the state. Yeah, right. Yes, I mean, there are articles that showed that in important matters, when these are important figures, um, derivative actions have lower uh, threshold to actually succeed it. But generally speaking, yes, I mean, uh, there's more, let's define, there's more legal accountability when we're talking about state capacity than when we're talking about uh, party capacities. Now, of course, the let's say that the party committee has done something that led to a corporate decision that went array, right? The the board of direct, the, any institution within the corporation cannot really uh, do anything about it, right? But and also any, any state institution under the legal system cannot really do anything about it. It's not that the CSRC will start investigating uh, what the party committee has done. And so any accountability mechanism, and not that it does not exist, it will be internal to the party. Yeah. Just to follow up on, on that, if in fact the party has no or little legal accountability, is there a particular law that indicates that? That it, that it doesn't have legal accountability? That it's above... Mm. above legal accountability well outside. actually well actually no and actually the constitution uh, uh, the prc constitution not the party constitution explicate very clearly that all parties are subject equally to the law Is so that a little different from what we just said no uh, well yes <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite of what i just said but it still doesn't mean <laughs> that, uh, that so the, the accountability has, actually applies. The legal, the law does not address this issue. It, is that accurate? I, I, issue yeah, of aside the from the constitution, from what I know, and I'm not an administrative law uh, professor, I know that uh, Professor Fu Hualeng and uh, Zhang Xian, uh, Xian Chu actually wrote a paper about uh, judging the party, right? The accountability of the party. It's a really interesting piece, highly recommend it. And um, party officials wearing party capacity, not state capacity, cannot be in general 
uh, subject to legal proceedings. The court system does not have uh, authority over such matters. But what legally gives that concept, you, you can't really state apparently. What it right, is. right. So you're asking if there is a, a legal provision that says that the party will not be subject to the law. <laughs> well, and, this, or leads uh, to that. Right. The short the official, doctrine of no, 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 no. Not that I know, but again, I'm sure that there are people who are really versed into it. Meaning, uh, yeah, not as far as I know. Um, going back for a moment to the party committees within corporations. So I assume they're not there primarily for anti-corruption measures. I assume they're there to have corporations more closely aligned with some party policies. Mm -hmm. Are those narrow policies like economic security and nationalism or are they broad policies like common prosperity? So what do the party committees hope to accomplish um, that they couldn't state or other, they couldn't accomplish in other ways up to Right. Now? It's, it's a really good question to which uh, we don't have a very good answer so far. Uh, what is clear is that the authority has expanded beyond just like um, the maybe the traditional function that we used to be seeing these party committees do, right? Like for example, um, ideological education, uh, coordinating uh, cultural activities, right? Um, and maybe taking care of labor uh, issues with labor unions and so on and so forth. So these uh, authorities have been expanded to more actual corporate governance. And that's what we see through the legal documents. Now, whether or not the uh, implementation is pulling those party committees to instruct corporation to infuse uh, geopolitical objectives or not, this is something that has not been actually tested. I don't think that there will be a way in these day, days and times in China to, to really decipher that. Uh, you don't need to disclose it in corporate disclosures. The only thing you need to disclose it are these types of provisions like I've, I've uh, showed on the board. Um, I, thought, just to interject, I thought you were suggesting in your presentation that those party committees might operate as a kind of inside Right. Um, yeah. So that's the second point. <laughs> right. Right. So that's the second point. So in terms of corporate decision making, we don't know. We just know that this is a, a, a viable lever to impact those funds. But I actually do a little bit disagree with you because I think that the anti-corruption functions and the legal obedience and monitoring functions are very, very substantial. I think that these are uh, uh, very meaningful primary reasons for establishing those party committees in the corporations to begin with. Well, I think it's, I think it was fairly clear that at least perception was that existing mechanisms such as independent directors and corporate auditors were not effective. Right. right. So that's fine. But at the same time, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but as I recall, state room enterprises generally are less profitable, generally are less efficient with capital um, than private companies. So you're also, big picture, paying the cost. If yes. you're going to make them more political, yes. more or even less profit oriented. Right. Um, and what we're saying you is. You would presume that there's a built in cost to have this political, the like, party committee do more. Right. And the party is aware. I think that it's it's very, very clear that it's aware of the costs and it's aware of the risks. And uh, there's this term in social media, I think that people are calling it uh, Yang Zhang Pi, which is like that double skin problem. Like how do these committees help in terms of actually improving production efficiency or uh, will they actually hold corporations off from interesting and important uh, investment decisions because they might be too risky, right? So there is a discussion about how do we make sure that these party committee members are being kept out of micromanaging everything. And there's actually, it's, it's a project that I hope to pursue, <laughs> uh, but uh, there's actually an indication, there are indications that um, party committee members are getting more and more um, economic education in order to be able to keep themselves or, or at least um, 
consider also efficiency considerations, for example. So when I, I showed on the board uh, that one of the functions that have been assigned to them is uh, the assessment of uh, managerial conducts, for example. And there is a difference between, and, and the, the rules actually mention it, that for a commercial industry firm outside strategic important industries, the assessment should take into consideration more market, uh, uh, will be more based on market forces than on you know, political uh, deviation or whatnot. Yeah. Thank you. Obviously a very interesting topic to pursue in the future. You just mentioned uh, something about disclosure with respect to these committees. Is anything about the function of the party committee in a company, a listed company, whether it be a SOE or private, is any disclosure ever made in the official uh, reports that listed companies are providing to the stock exchanges, whether in China or abroad? And are questions being asked, as you can see so far, it's early days yet, I realize, but at uh, when, when, when Chinese companies are listed abroad, uh, including in Hong Kong, uh, but also Singapore, uh, New York, and London, and so on, when they have uh, shareholder meetings and uh, and other public disclosures, do they say anything about the role of the party committees? Mm. Um, are they listed, are they discussed in the prospectuses of mm. newly listed companies? In terms of uh, cross-border, cross yeah, so firms that are Listed, listed, say, abroad. yeah, listed mm -hmm. abroad, exactly. Because, I mean, you could make an argument that it's material, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, certainly traditionally, I know when I was practicing uh, markets, mm -hmm. capital markets for Chinese companies to New York, it was not, we did not treat it as material, mm -hmm. this, the, whether or not there was a party committee in the company, that that was quite a long time ago. Is it now considered material? So interestingly enough, the... Congress apparently did not consider it material. Mm. And in the HFCA Act, where they actually, um, mm. that is the the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, sorry mm. to say. Yes, it's the, it's the act um, enacted by uh, Congress 2020, December 2020, I think, that um, was basically, was proclaimed that it is designed to improve the audit quality of China-based US listed firms. It's, it opens up a completely different uh, subject. And actually there's a forthcoming paper that I co-authored with uh, Professor Jesse Fried of Harvard about this specific issue. But the bottom line is that um, there were several requirements in that uh, HFCA Act that for disclosure of various state and party connections for you know, China-based US listed firms. And while it was uh, firms were asked, uh, firms that were identified as firms that do not comply with audit requirements were asked to disclose ties with the Chinese Communist Party, including if they have provisions in the charter that established party organizations in the firm, mm -hmm. the same type of disclosure was not applied to newly listed China-based uh, uh, issuers. So apparently Congress do not think that it's material enough mm -hmm. to ask for newly list from newly listed companies. But that's again it's a really side a side note. In terms of what do they actually disclose in disclose in their uh, corporate charters, I did not do the empirical research for that, but uh, Professor Lauren Lin and Professor Curtis Milhap actually did some research about the types of disclosures that uh, public firms private and state invested enterprise uh, release uh, in terms of their adoption of party committee organizations. And they have seen variations in the text, meaning the more that the firm is politically connected and has uh, uh, maybe belong to, um, if I remember correctly, the research, belong to a strategically important industry or a, a con tightly controlled by the state, then it will stick to the wording that is required according to the law. But the more down, the more you dilute this control or the political influence, then they have more flexibility to play with the provision and kind of adopt something that is very, very vague uh, uh, 
uh, speaks about the presence of the party committee kind of in general terms. So, um, first of all, I want to say that I'm I'm not convinced yet that what we're seeing now in the market, investors shying off China, particularly foreign investors, but also local investors shying off the capital market. I'm not yet convinced that this is because the presence of the party in firms. It could be uh, uh, very dependent on geopolitics, I think, and the general atmosphere around investing in China. And... Um, it, it could be a lot of uh, different uh, variables, of course, influencing uh, what's going on right now. Um, but no doubt that having a party organization in firms and being aware to its presence and to its uh, potentially growing authority might have some costs. This is, of, of course, it's, it's not something that is uh, uh, that you can deny. It can uh, make managers more risk averse, right? They are concerned that whatever action they're taking in a corporation will be more uh, supervised and um, they're concerned for their economic and political trajectory. Of course, it might impact their decision-making. And that's why I said that um, at least from the debates on this issue, it seems like the party is aware that this is an issue that this might be a problem that will affect economic costs in the corporation. And that's one of the reasons that it has tailored the authority of these party committees to, um, uh, depending on the industry in which the firm operate. So if in a more commercial industry, those party committees are supposed to be uh, less intervening let's say, in more competitive industries, less intervening than they are in non-competitive industries. Now, whether or not they'll be able to be held back now, we don't know that. As I said, this is still a, a very much open question. And um, that's what I have to say about that at this point. Thank you. Um, this is a general question about the CCP's authoritarian, um, I wanted to say style, but <laughs> style is the right word, right? Not at all. So this is a general question about authoritarian governance, right? This is not specifically with respect to whether or not other countries want to adopt political organizations within firms, right? Because I didn't see any evidence of, of the latter. <laughs> But in terms of adopting authoritarian characteristics from China, I, yes, we do see uh, countries that are considering uh, different, for example, it's very clear in facial recognition, right? And technology, it's, it's very, very clear that there are spillovers of, uh, uh, spillover effects of, of, of China's, you know, the fact that we had globalization and we had China integrating into the world economy also meant that convergence flow both ways, <laughs> that other countries learn uh, methods and systems that might work for them uh, that they have uh, borrowed from the Chinese system. So there we do see some influences, yes. And I think that this is one of the difficulties and problems that the US is with, uh, with China, the fact that their influence is growing. I'm gonna pick up you in your response just now, you, you, you said, yes, of course, that this new uh, interventionism of the party, the form of party committees inside corporations, as an example, will bring some costs. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, possibly um, making managers more intimidated or you know concerned about you know it could affect their motivation. What about on a broader scale, mm -hmm. um, the question of affecting party legitimacy? And I and this came up quite a bit during uh, the zero COVID policy, specifically with respect to party general secretary Xi Jinping himself, that he was intervening and was was seen to be intervening and wanted to be seen as intervening in a very personal, I'm in charge way. I am the one leading these meetings and I am making the decisions and this is my policy. Um, and when that policy seemed to go off the rails and not work, um, he personally has suffered some reputational mm -hmm. facts, both domestically and internationally. So 
could there be reputational effects and even legitimacy effects for the party mm -hmm. in this much more aggressive and much more in front of the curtain role that it wants to play? Mm -hmm. Um, speculations, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Have you seen any evidence hitherto? Right. <laughs> so, um, I'll I'll start by saying that I I I actually when when I answered Professor Zhang's question before that, and I said that we see positive impact of uh, intra firms, uh, party committees being established. And, and that was before 2021, mm -hmm. I think that one of the changes that might actually put this whole um, agenda and progress in a negative light mm -hmm. comes from the way that the party handled COVID. Mm -hmm. Because I think that how the party handled COVID illuminated the costs of massive intervention in the population mm -hmm. and the arbitrariness with which it can actually happen mm -hmm. and deny uh, uh, the rights of citizens. So uh, I think that now any potential party intervention is seen much more negative. Like the costs are much clearer now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I said that the uh, the positive effect of this might be actually different mm -hmm. or will be less positive effect today than we have uh, we've said, we've seen until twenty twenty one. In terms of whether or not um, intervention within firms can impact the legitimacy and the, uh, maybe the have some reputational costs on the party, again, I, I think that my answer is really different. Uh, I would have assessed before 2021 that no, <laughs> but now when it comes along with all the other aspects of intervention and, you know, uh, penetrating into individual lives in terms of the information collected and like when it all comes together, mm -hmm. we might have, we might see some reputational and legitimacy issues and we've seen the protest of the COVID, but um, mm -hmm. and, no, but it's still early days. Uh, I think so. And it, and it also can be, you know, a, a, a flowing by episode in Chinese history because mm -hmm. like many other debacles political and economic debacles mm -hmm. have been, right? The Chinese population can forget about it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so the economy gets back on track yeah. and everybody starts to feel flush again. Mm -hmm. Read chapter five in my book, <laughs> Political and Economic <laughs> Determinants. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think that uh, there are two angles to this um, to the reasons. One is political angle, the other one is economic angle. In terms of economic angle, what happens is that around 2010, um, the party is starting to understand that it it's losing its competitive advantage in the global economy, right? It can no longer rely on exports, on being an invested led uh, system. It has to adapt, it has to develop a new model, right? A new economic model. And so it turns to uh, being a more developing a more self sufficient technology quality based uh, economic model, mm -hmm. and we're seeing the legal system being enlisted in that process through many many uh, programs, industrial scheme uh, schemes, but also uh, actual legal programs, the mixed ownership reform, the way that uh, the Chinese party state can actually steer capital through mixed ownership to areas where it sees significance and strategic importance under this new economic model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is one way. Um, and we're seeing also that this is, has been advanced through Made in China 2025 and military civil fusion and made in, in China standard uh, 2035 and, you know, name it, right? Belt and Road Initiative, everything happened since the, um, uh, 12 five-year plan, which started in 2011. So I really think that this is the economic turning point mm -hmm. that had significant uh, results in law and the way that laws and legal constructs have been facilitated to establish this, uh, this shift. And so this is economically. Politically, I think that this was a turning point because with all of these economic uh, uh, slowdowns, and with the accumulation of costs brought by state capitalism during the previous era, the party was losing its legitimacy 
basically. The model was weakening both ideologically with opening up, right? Uh, both ideologically, but also in terms of the actual uh, governing legitimacy of the party because of corruption, because of state capture and all of the things that we've talked about. And so also in terms of political reasons, the party had to enlist the law better, I would say, <laughs> to, its, uh, to its aid and make it more substantial, more in the front in terms of governing markets. So if it's institu thank you for this question. If it's an institutional account, uh, Cambridge Core, open access, uh, not open access, sorry, there's two different things, right? But Cambridge Core for institutions and um, online, I suppose, through Cambridge. The slides, yeah. uh, whomever those people are, send me an email. So in just the, the last minute, um, I'll, I'll throw in a question that um, goes to your method. Mm. Um, so I was really taken by the approach you took was to build your theory on uh, a database that you had created of what I can only guess is thousands and thousands of documents, mm -hmm. right, from 1978 up through um, 2021, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, what, what did you, why did you decide this approach? What did you think were the advantages of using this and what are the limitations of this method? of using these documents. I mean, I was thinking, for example, of the fact that reading the text doesn't tell you anything about how it was implemented or even if it was implemented. Right. Right. Um, and um, it also doesn't tell us anything about the informal ways that the party operates, you know, the things that are not captured in the documents. So those came to my mind, but what, why did you decide on this part? Why did you right. So there are a lot of carriers uh, mm -hmm. to this method, absolutely. Um, informal ways have been impacting the way that uh, China governs for forever, right? And we have no way, mm -hmm. or maybe not no way, but today there are less and less ways to get uh, in real information on political relations and how it impacts uh, people. The, the idea Paul was the idea here was actually to um, to look specifically at formal law mm -hmm. not it, it wasn't a mistake in the research design I, I didn't want to look at how citizens implement the law <laughs> okay. it's not that I ignore it right I think that this aspect is has been researched uh, pretty extensively there's a lot uh, covered in the book that relies on secondary material that speaks about that, at least in the context of corporate governance. What I wanted to understand is how political economic change is reflected through formal law and how formal law secures a desired political economic change. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I, I stuck with that's one of the reasons that I stuck with uh, formal documents. And yes, um, First of all, we need to remember that I only uh, read, although I sifted a lot of documents, I only read and analyzed those that are related to markets. Mm -hmm. So it's not all laws and regulations issued by okay. that. I'm afraid, yeah. mm -hmm. um, um, so, so basically, um, the idea is to shed another light on how politics impact mm -hmm. uh, and how how law and politics intertwine of course there are a lot of other ways in which political determinants affect mm -hmm. the law mm -hmm. and there are many great studies about that right political connections in firms um how politics uh, affected uh the way that the company law was devised uh right so there there are a lot of great studies most of them i hope uh appear in the book as secondary material mm -hmm. but here is it's really the 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 framework aspect of it. They can yes. all live under this framework yes. of political economic uh, change. Yes, yes. Okay, so with that, I think we've come to the end of our time, but thank you so much for this Thanks fantastic for having me. conversation. It's, really great. it's a, I can attest it's a wonderful book and very sweeping and ambitious in its scope. Uh, for those who, like me, remember the 80s, it is a fantastic opportunity to look at it with some distance. And um, so I highly recommend getting it online. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.